So I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. And it's good to know that all of you are getting training to teach and share Krishna consciousness through the medium of teaching. It's one of the most important services that anyone can ever do. And uh, Srila Prabhupada wanted that uh, everyone, in whatever way possible, share Krishna consciousness. And that is the mood of the Bhagavad Gita also. So it's one thing to want to share. It's another thing to invest time to learn what to share. It's even more a sign of dedication to learn how to share. So to share is good. To know how to learn what to, what to share is better. But to learn how to share is the best. So all of you are doing that. And I'm happy to be of service. So, <clears throat> so today I'll speak on the topic of uh, sensitivity in speaking. And uh, so as teachers, all of us have a responsibility to help those whom we, with whom we are sharing the knowledge, to help them come closer to Krishna. So this is a PowerPoint which I'll be showing. And along with that, I'll also be using it as a, as a whiteboard. So I may write something in the PowerPoint along the way also. So I'll be basing this on the Bhagavad Gita 1715, where Krishna talks about discipline of speech, austerity of speech. He says, Anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat swadhyaya bhisanam chayva one mayam tapa uchate. So he's talking one mayam tapa. This is the discipline or the austerity of speech. And when we do this discipline, then our speech will become effective. So what does he talk about as the characteristics of this speech? I've analyzed this in terms of a diagram. So Krishna talks about two components that when we are disciplining the speech, it needs to be sensitive and sensible. Sensitive refers to the awareness of the impact it is going to have on the audience. And sensible refers to the content of what we are speaking. So both. So sensitive is non-agitating or pleasing. So anudvega karam vakyam and priyam, Krishna says. So that is non-agitating and pleasing. And then as far as sensible is concerned, it's a satyam, truthful and hitam, beneficial. So we need to balance both these aspects when we are speaking, sensitive and sensible. Now, if we consider, I'll be talking mainly two points. Sometimes, especially as teachers of Krishna consciousness, we may spiritual, use spirituality to rationalize verbal violence. Verbal violence means that I may mm, think that because I know what is right, I will speak the right thing no matter how it affects others. So that is a temptation and we need to avoid that temptation. So that will be the major part of the talk. And then I'll talk also when and how to speak strongly. So now to put it another way, the same point of effective speech. So there's a speaker here. And then around the speaker, there is an unspoken attitude toward hearer. So with what attitude do we approach our hearers? And then, of course, there is a hearer and then there's the content of what we speak. Hmm. So now we can't directly control the hearers. Of course, we can choose whom we are speaking to, to some extent. But that's not in our control. Once the audience has come, they are there. We can't change them immediately. They are where they are. So if we want them to change, what are the two tools we have? One is the content of the speech. And it is our attitude, the attitude with which we are looking at them. So <clears throat> when Prabhupada went to America, what was his attitude? Most people would have considered, most people would have considered that, that the, sorry, it's not attitude toward speaker, it is attitude toward hearer. So most people, when Prabhupada went to America and he went to the, Hippies. Now, when he went to the hippies at that time, most people would have considered his uh, those hippies to be not at all 
they were so degraded that in fact they would not be capable of receiving krishna consciousness that would have been his understanding in fact in general in india it was considered that across the oceans towards the west the, f- the further we go the more degraded things become mm. but the hippies were considered degraded even by western standards what to speak of vedic standards and prabhupad could easily have an attitude of condescension mm. of condemnation these are these are fallen people these are sinful people these are worthless people but prabhupad never had that attitude toward them hmm? none of the people who came to meet prabhupad ever felt that prabhupad made them feel that we are sinful that we are impure that just by being with prabhupad they felt like wanting to become pure prabhupad did not uh, mince words in talking about the principles of bhakti but prabhupad did not make people feel impure he inspired them to become pure and that was because his attitude was filled with compassion not condescension not looking at certain attributes and uh, condemning people for those attributes so the attitude towards hearer is extremely important and then based on that the content of speech that we have so sometimes it can be palatable sometimes it can be unpalatable now sensitivity does not mean that we always speak palatable speech only sometimes we may have to speak unpalatable speech and we will talk about that uh, in due course but the important thing is that what is the attitude with which we are speaking when an unpalatable speech is made with a attitude of condemnation or condescension that completely alienates people but when even unpalatable speech is made with an attitude of compassion where people can see or sense the compassion then they don't feel that bad about it they still feel bad but not too much so once we have that attitude of compassion we may also be able to see how we can speak even unpalatable truth in a in the least unpalatable way so we'll look at that now sometimes the speech might be just neutral also it's just functional we're just giving some information there's nothing palatable or unpalatable about it mm. now neutral speech is usually not transformational it is you give some information to somebody they may find it useful that's okay that doesn't positively endear or transform so now if we when we talk about sensitive speaking i gave one reference already anudek karam vakyam satyam prihitam chait but there are many other references the bhagavad gita the the bhagavad gita is not the only reference we see in the updesha amrit one of the characteristics of pure devotee is described to be anya ninda di shunya one who doesn't have any tendency to criticize anyone mm-hmm. then the gita also says that the characteristic of the godly people the characteristic of those with daiva prakriti is apaishunam apaishunam prabhupa translates as aversion to fault finding not that they don't find faults but they don't like to find faults generally we'd say we should be beyond attachment and aversion but is interesting aversion to something is considered to be a virtue of the godly people of those with daivi prakriti so aversion here means not that uh, you hate the hate fault finders or hate fault finding but it's just that we don't like it we don't take joy in it so that is not something which we look forward to so i verge into fault finding sorry are you able to hear and see okay then there is of course the gita's 326 krishna says don't agitate the minds of others na buddhi bhedam janayet agyanam karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidwan yuktah samacharan in fact he is very very categorically he is saying even if people are attached and you are detached even if people are ignorant and you are knowledgeable still don't disturb people's minds what does he say he says elevate them gradually elevate them gradually so now he's not saying okay in the name of not not agitating them just leave them where they are no give them a path for gradual elevation the point is don't speak un- unpalatably we shouldn't think that just because people are wrong and we know what is the right thing we have a right to condemn them for being wrong hmm? 
no don't agitate the minds of people in general whenever a person comes for any spiritual program or any spiritual circle no it's a, it's a reasonable inference to assume that people are coming with some kind of agitation already in their mind the world is an agitating place and yes sometimes we may have to correct their misconceptions but if our speech adds to the agitation of their mind and that is the primary or that is the sole contribution that we are doing then at least as they perceive it then they will say why should i keep coming here so not agitating the mind is important and then the gita in 183 in the 18th chapter krishna talks about two categories of people those who say that yagya dana karma should be done yagya dana tapa should be done and those who say that yagya dana tapa should not be done and krishna says actually yagya dana tapa should be done they should not be given up but while krishna talks about the other party that those who say yagya dana tapa should be given up so he says they are also manishinaha manishinaha means they are thinkers literally manishina means mana isha those who have control their mind now what the the word name manish is quite common most of us may not know the implication of manish what it means is one who is the controller of their mind what it means is that they do, that mind just is wander here and there they can think deeply about issues they are thinkers so krishna is referring even to those who are teaching something opposite to what he is teaching as manishina ha so this is very striking sometimes you say this person is wrong i have to call him wrong i call him i call him a fool no not so simple why is krishna referring to them as manishina because he is saying that he is he is appreciating the fact that thinking that these people are also thinking what is the way to become disentangled from the world so some people say the way to disentangle become disentangled is to act with detachment others is to say to renounce the world but he is appreciating the good in them the good is that they are thinking about how to become disentangled from the world so even if there's even if that can everyone mute their mics please okay so uh, i think mata ji are you the host or am i on the only, only host prabhu ji you are the host okay sure so yeah so now here we see krishna showing the example that even people whom he who is teaching something opposite he is not dismissing them as foolish he is appreciating the good in them now you may say yes this is fine but we see so many times when prabhupad uses strong words yes prabhupad does use strong words but let's look at it over here so prabhupad uses a word like say rascals or fools and sometimes these words may strike us when we see them in his speak speaking or speaker writing but prabhupad was very measured and careful when he used such words so if you look at this count the maximum amount of time prabhupad used such words were when uh, prabhupad spoke uh, in his private conversations hmm and that is now his conversations were recorded but they were with his very close and committed followers and if this also we want to consider this is out of this is the number of words prabhupad himself actually spoke what happened over here okay so this is how how many words prabhupad spoke what happened yeah so prabhupad spoke something like 143 million words so totally we have 143 million words he has spoken and out of that if you see 2791 words that is not even 1 person that is not even 0.1% it may be something like point not not 1% even less than that and even in that if you see that prabhupad spoke those words like this 
uh, far lesser in his lectures, less than half of that time in his lectures, and one three seven three times. And then, if you look at his books, there we see it is even almost one fourth of the number of times he spoke that in his lectures, he spoke such words in his books, and half of that he has spoken it in. He, what he wrote as books, many of Prabhupada's books, like Life Comes from Life or even Science of Self-Realization, they were lectures or conversations which were put in the book form. But there's something which Prabhupada himself either typed or dictated to be books. So it is that Prabhupada spoke strongly, but Prabhupada was not indiscriminate in speaking strongly at all times. Hmm. Prabhupada was measured in his speech. And there are many occasions when Prabhupada could have chosen to speak strongly, but he spoke effectively. So, for example, the, many of you know the incident when a hippie came and asked Prabhupada. This hippie was all stoned on LSD. And he asked, Swamiji, what is the happiness of the spiritual world? Now, Prabhupada could have said that you know, if you are taking drugs, you are breaking the regulatory principles. You cannot even get any glimpse of what the happiness of the spiritual world means. And Prabhupada could have quoted Shastra to support that. But what did Prabhupada say? Prabhupada explained in terms that he could make sense. He said that the happiness of the spiritual world is like an ocean of LSD. Now, there is no scripture which says something like that. LSD itself is not mentioned in the scripture. But what is Prabhupada doing? Prabhupada is communicating the truth in a way that makes sense to the person and attracts the person. Oh, yeah, the ocean of LSD. I would like to experience that. So that's Prabhupada's expertise. So it's not that to follow Prabhupada, we have to necessarily speak strongly. Yes, there are times when we speak strongly, but more important than speaking strongly is speaking effectively. Speaking effectively means we attract people towards the truth, not that we alienate them from the truth. Now, why might we speak strongly sometimes? Now, sometimes what happens is because we have spiritual knowledge and especially if we are having some practices, you know, we have a good sadhana, we, we follow the four regular principles, we may start thinking that this gives us the right to condemn others. Because of this, we may not see people fully. And we may not even see ourselves fully. By see people fully means we may not appreciate the good in them as Prabhupada did with the Hupipis. And we may not see ourselves fully means we may not see that actually I'm not speaking from a platform of compassion. I am speaking from a platform of arrogance. I am speaking from a platform of condescension, looking down at others. So yes, it's important for us to have knowledge. It's important for us to have practices. But the result of this should be that we develop a godly nature and we learn to see more and more good in others. Now, broadly, where do we need sensitivity? Generally, when we see something is wrong and we feel that I should fix it. Now, how do I go fixing it? Now, broadly, there can be two things wrong in people. One is they may have wrong conceptions and they may have wrong actions. Wrong conceptions means somebody may say that, oh, God is impersonal. Or somebody may say there is no God. Mm -hmm. Or they may have wrong actions. Mm, they may be they may be taking meat, they may be taking meat, they may be having uh, unrestrained sexual indulgence, they may be doing so many things like that. So generally, in terms of people's concept, people's conceptions or people's actions, we may see something wrong. And when we see that wrong, we may think, oh, this person is so terrible. This person is about to go to hell. And if I don't speak something to save him, this person already has one hand, one leg in hell. Actually, by my strong speech, I can pull him out. I pull him or her out. We might think like that. But it's not that simple. See people fully means what? We, we don't see people fully. We don't see the good within them. It may be presently some good is there or potentially some good is in there. In there. Now, Prabhupada saw the potential good in the hippies. They were disillusioned, disenchanted with, um, with the, as they call the great American dream that, you know, become wealthy, have a good family, have a good job, have a good life. He said, this life is not good enough. We want something more. 
So Prabhupada appreciated that good. Although they're searching for something good, was in an unhealthy direction. They were exploring through drugs. But he appreciated the good in them. And sometimes when we, what happens is we see people's faults and we presume that this is all that they have, that that is all that they have. And there's nothing more to them apart from their faults. And they will always have those faults. So, and we tend to label people. This person is a mayavadi. This person is a meat eater. This person is a, is, is like this. This person is like that. But what happens is, now yes, from a functional perspective, in the world, labels may be required. If somebody is forgetful, and we want to give them some service. And yes, we have to be careful if we give them that service. So yes, from a functional perspective, labels may be required. But we can't see labels as permanent character definers. People change. And even if they have some defects, still they are not limited to that particular negative quality. They may have other good qualities. So it is unnecessarily, it is undesirable and it is unhealthy. It damages them. It damages our attitude toward them. It damages our ability to help them. So now, in fact, the more we learn philosophy, the more quick we become to put labels on people. Oh, this person is a demigod worshiper. This person is this. This person is this. This person is this. In general, in India, I even avoid using the word demigod. Because what happens is people start, the way we devotees sometimes speak the word demigod, we speak it with so much negativity and derision. I was in America and I was giving one class and then says, one person came, what is this demigod? Are they demons? I said, demons? Why demons? They, they are devtas. He said, no, how do people speak about them so negatively? I thought they must be demons. It sounds also like demons. So now the, there is no word demigod in scripture per se. So in, most Indians understand, so I straight simply use the word Devta. Hmm? There is Krishna is Bhagawan and there are Devtas. So of course that is something which is up to individual. But the point is, we don't have to uh, label people. Yes, somebody may be a worshipper of the Devta, but that doesn't mean that they don't have, they don't have an interest in Krishna. They, they may not come to Krishna temple. They may not have interest in Krishna Bhakti. They may have, and we can find that. And being a worshipper of the Devta, might be still better than being a materialist or atheist. So we reduce people to labels. So sometimes the more knowledge we have, the more quickly we get la more labels to fix on people. Oh, this person is like this, this person is like this, this person is like this. And that can be unhealthy. So now just the, the, the scriptures do radically challenge our conceptions. So in the mm, Mahabharata, there is a section which is called the Vyadha Gita. Vyadha, Vyadha means hunter or butcher. So this is philosophical wisdom given by a butcher, butcher to a sage. The sage is basically a renunciate. And this is elaborate instructions that the butcher gives. Now we wonder if somebody is a butcher. You may think a butcher, a meat eater is bad, but a butcher is somebody who actually kills. How can such a person have any philosophical knowledge? But what is the what is the Mahabharata doing? It's challenging our conceptions. So, in fact, the, this Vyada is mentioned as a great devotee, as a noteworthy devotee in the Bhagavatam. So, it's not just in the Mahabharata, in the Bhagavatam, in the Uddhav Gita, uh, the Vyada is also referred to again. So, the point is that the scripture show yes, sometimes some people may have some negative behavioral attributes, but they are not reducible to that alone. So, the point of this pastime is not that. All butchers are automatically wise. That is not the point. But the point is that we shouldn't stereotypically presume that because a person has having this kind of behavior, that means this person will have no wisdom. This person is ignorant. This person is senseless. No, there's no necessary correlation like that. Why is that? Now, how can a butcher have wisdom? Because Gana Karmano Gati Krishna says in the fourth chapter, 17 verse, that karma is very complicated. So, people's present situations may result from a complex bend of mixed past karma. Mixed past karma means that some of their karma might be good, some of their karma might be bad. So, because of their good karma, they may have spiritual knowledge. Because of their bad karma, they might be put in a situation where they 
they are engaged in a profession that is considered uh, that is considered quite uh, unfortunate and terrible so we can't uh, so pa their past good karma leads to wisdom and their past bar kar bad karma may lead to an unfortunate profession so life is complex sometimes people who may be in um, in what we might call a sinful professions may still have virtues in them so what happens is people are not unidimensional their entire character is not determined by just one behavior now whatever it is whatever particular behavior we might find all of us will have our own things which we find very objectionable and we may think somebody is behaving like that somebody may use foul words and now it's definitely not good to use foul words but just because somebody uses foul words doesn't mean necessarily that everything that the person says is foolish foul language is not good but they may speak something intelligent also so we can't reduce people down to one aspect of their character so this is why we need to avoid absolutizing people are complex conscious beings they are not monochromatic philosophical categories what do i mean by this that people are people are people they are conscious beings they are not philosophical categories and they are complex there are multiple facets to him you know when prabhupad was living in america initially he was in butler pennsylvania then he went to new york there he was staying with one dr patel he was a yoga teacher and dr patel was at the opposite spectrum of philosophy as compared to prabhupad he was a advaitin he taught he taught impersonal philosophy and prabhupada and he would have quite a few arguments at times and many years later after krishna consciousness was spread and uh, he came once and came met prabhupada in mumbai and when he came prabhupada he came to prabhupada's room and prabhupada had a very cordial talk they remembered their times together and they, they were joking and laughing and they departed and then giriraj maharaj was there and he observed he said prabhupada i thought this dr mishra this Dr. Mishra is uh, Mayavadi. Said yes, and then Prabhupada said, philosophically, we argue like anything, but culturally, we are friends. Culturally, we are friends. So Prabhupada was not reducing Dr. Mishra down to oh, you are a Mayavadi. There is nothing more to you. No, Prabhupada looked at him. Okay, he is also a cultured gentleman. He also went to the West to try to share some Indian spiritual wisdom. and there was so much in common they had so this reducing people to one category is is the reason why we may have a negative attitude remember i started by talking two things what is our attitude toward our audience and what do we speak to the audience so right now this whole discussion is how we may have a negative attitude toward our audience and one negative attitude we, we look down at the audience we condemn them and how do we condemn them by look seeing one negative thing in them and reducing their whole being their whole character their whole personality to that one negative attribute so earlier i talked about uh, negative behaviors and now i am talking about say uh, incorrect philosophical conceptions both don't give us a justification to speak wrongly so now all meat eaters don't have the same character all no not all meat some meat eaters may be violent but does that mean all meat eaters are violent no just as are do all vegetarians have same character no it is just one behavioral attribute in fact one of the biggest ironies of the last century was that the person the one person who was probably responsible for more human deaths than anyone else that was hitler and hitler was a vegetarian <laughs> so now and in no way minimizing the importance of avoiding meat eating yes it's terrible it's there's violence but you know, what do we most of us have in common with hitler nothing we are we are vegetarians but does that define make our character similar to his no so people are complex beings yes we can look at we can note certain behavioral patterns or certain philosophical conceptions they have but don't reduce them to that if you reduce them then knowingly or unknowingly our attitude will not stay compassionate we will look down at them it will become condescension or even condemnation so i talked about this first point how we may use spirituality to rationalize verbal violence 
Now I'll talk about when and how to speak strongly. We're not saying that never speak strongly. There are times when we need to speak that. So we talked about the attitude toward the speaker and now we're looking at the content of the speech. So we, our purpose is to speak the truth. And yes, sometimes the truth is unpalatable. So and if we speak something unpalatable, that is quite likely to be unpopular. So if somebody, some, if, uh, say, if somebody uh, has a, runs a alcohol shop or somebody runs a meat shop and they say, is meat eating okay? Or is, is eating, consuming alcohol okay? Now we cannot say it's, it's just okay. Now, then we may not condemn them for that and we may give a gradual pathway for them to help them come out of it. But sometimes we have to speak unpalatable truth. We can't avoid that. So, but at the same time, even when we have to speak unpalatable truth, so we, our purpose is not simply to be popular. That, oh, I, if I speak this, I'll become popular. We don't speak for popularity. But then we don't speak for unpopularity either. Mm -hmm. Truth may be unpalatable, but unpalatability is not the sole test of truth. <laughs> that means that I can't say that just because I am speaking something unpalatable, that means it must be true. And worse still, I know one particular preacher, he said, I am, I am very unhappy with the status of ISKCON right now. He said, why? He said, because ISKCON is becoming so popular. I said, what's wrong with that? You know, if we are speaking the truth, we would not be popular. Now, that is a quite a perverse idea of things. <laughs> Now, does that mean the test of purity is unpopularity? No, that is not the test of purity. The test of purity is purity. How much we love Krishna? Prabhupada sought popularity, not at the cost of purity. How, what do you mean Prabhupada sought popularity? Prabhupada went to America and he went to the West and he brought Western disciples. And when Western disciples came here, they captivated the Indian cultural imagination. And that captivated Indians and Prabhupada became very, very celebrated at that time. So Prabhupada, so popularity itself is not bad, but popularity is not our purpose. Our, not, not the unpopularity our purpose. Our purpose is to share spiritual wisdom in a way that attracts people. So we can't say that if, say, we speak something and people get upset, then uh, some people may say, yeah, you know, that's because they are attached, because they are illusion. And they're not going to like what I speak. Because I am speaking the truth. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it is not you are speaking the truth. Maybe it is because you are speaking in a way that alienates people. So, so right now we are shifting to what do we speak? Yes, sometimes we have to speak the, to speak the truth which may be unpalatable. So the truth may be unpalatable, but it doesn't have to be spoken unpalatably. It doesn't have to be spoken unpalatably. So we sometimes, we sometimes overlook how Prabhupada was also very uh, sensitive and careful in what he spoke, even to his own disciples. When Prabhupada had brought his uh, Western disciples for the first time to India, there's one disciple. Uh, he had brought two or three disciples. One of them was Kirtananda. He became Kirtanan Swami. He was quite dedicated and devout at that time. There's another who somehow lost interest in Krishna consciousness and he started wearing a long beard, long hair and he was, was quite disheveled in his looks. And because he was Prabhupada disciple, he would go everywhere with, for, for Prabhupada's programs. And then he would misrepresent Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada told uh, one of his closer disciples, now tell him to you know, dress in a proper way, to be more neat and tidy. And Prabhupada didn't tell him directly, all that was his own disciple. And then he told, but he said he didn't listen. And then after that, one day that devotee came to meet Prabhupada. And he told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, this uh, new back to God has come. Oh, okay. So Prabhupada opened it. And Prabhupada looked at it. And he said, there was a story of Haridas Thakur. And how Haridas Thakur had transformed the prostitute. So he, he said, you know, what do you see in this? This is how Hridas Thakur's potency. He said, yeah, but what do you see the difference between the two pictures? So there's a picture of this uh, prostitute earlier and there's a picture of prostitute later. 
so he said that the she had she had a very seductive appearance earlier and now she was looking like a devotee so she had cut her hair and she looked in a very a very devotee saintly way so pras what do you difference is a devotee so what does it mean propa said ah uh, propa she has cut her hair yes then this devotee said propa do you want me to cut my hair he said yes so <laughs> so even the simple point we may say prabhupad was sensitive so prabhupad was we may reduce again i earlier talked about reducing people we may reduce prabhupad also we say this is how prabhupad, if i have to be faithful to prabhupad that means this is the way i have to speak no prabhupad was multifaceted he spoke at different times in different ways now now we may say what about speaking strongly yes you have to speak strongly and we may say if i don't speak the truth it is compromise yes that is true not speaking the truth is compromise but knowing which truth to speak when that is not compromise that is intelligence knowing which truth to speak when that is intelligence most of the life members most of the indians who helped prabhupad during his preaching in india they were they were already well established businessmen well established in society and they already had their own spiritual connections in fact two of the biggest uh, life life members biggest in the sense that they offered the biggest help to prabhupad both of them were very close and initiated disciples of advaitic gurus and they came to prabhupad because uh, they appreciated what prabhupad was doing for for indian culture for indian spirituality and they wanted to contribute now prabhupad visited their homes now he told us radhanath maharaj and he told us giriraj maharaj both told me that they, we also visited their homes many times said so right in their homes when they went you know at the entrance itself in their various rooms in their altar they had big pictures of these advaitic gurus and prabhupad never spoke one word negative about them prabhupad they wanted to do some seva and prabhupad engaged them in seva so prabhupad chose which truth to speak you say oh you know this is advaitavad and advaitavad is uh, uh, this is wrong and you are having a guru who is advaitavadi well that was not the truth that was relevant at that time for that person if somebody is already initiated disciple and somebody is already committed to a particular path for them to change is not that easy the first thing that is required for them to change is to develop trust to develop a relationship so prabhupad focused on developing that relationship focused on giving them pious credits by engaging them in krishna's service and they did an extraordinary amount of service to krishna uh, through by offering shri prabhupad so many uh, so many so much support in the, especially the juhu temple so his honest radhanath maharaj told me personally when i was talking with him about this once so he said with one of these life members maharaj was personally there with him uh, just a day or two before he departed from the world he was quite old and he said when i met him he was uh, he was remembering shri prabhupad and glorifying shri prabhupad and he had so much devotion for prabhupad he had tears in his eyes and he said at that time i was think maharaj was saying that i was thinking at that time no will krishna see just the fact that when he was going to depart from the world this person this life member was krishna going to see oh this person was initiated by a, by so and so guru or was krishna going to see how much service he had done to prabhupad how much devotion he had to prabhupad so he may have been nominally initiated he may have be appreciated that guru also but people cannot be reduced to their philosophical affiliation also or their institutional affiliation so they may be affiliated institution just like in our movement we have devotees are all is con devotees the same no everybody is individual everybody is different we can have wide variety of differences so saragrahi essence seekers rather than reducing this person this person is a mayavadi because initiated by mayavadi guru i saw that they had a service attitude they had devotional mood and krishna is saragrahi krishna is ultimately is the essence seeker so bhavagrahi is you know we talk about krishna not saragrahi is bhavagrahi so krishna will see the bhav of seva the bhav of bhakti and krishna will elevate that person so knowing which truth to speak when is not compromise it is intelligence so some people may say that it's a simple choice do you have the courage to 
speak the actual truth or you are cowardly and you speak the compromised truth and when you phrase it this way itself sometimes some questions are phrased in a wrong way there is a question in a the phrased in such a way that there is no right answer to the question so you know do you have the courage to speak the truth or are you cowardly and you are going to speak a, uh, going to speak the compromised truth well that is not the actual choice this is a so it's why is this not the actual choice see sometimes when people ask this question we have to question the question itself so if somebody the, the famous example of a loaded question is if somebody asks a man so have you stopped beating your wife what now there is no right answer to this question he says yes he says you rascal you used to beat your wife ah uh, no you rascal you are still beating your wife so <laughs> the question is phrased in such a way that there is no right answer so we can't answer the question we have to question the question so if somebody says you know so will you have the courage to speak the truth or will you be cowardly and compromise so the question are those the only two choices are those the actual choices no these are not the actual choices what is the actual choice how to speak we do we speak in a way that attracts people to the truth or do we speak in a way that alienates people from the truth that is the actual choice so truth is not one thing in the truth there are many many different aspects of the truth so we need to speak in a way that attracts people to the truth so sensitivity doesn't mean that we compromise the truth sensitivity means we are compassionate and give people the opportunity to come closer to krishna from wherever they are with whatever kind of actions they may be doing with whatever kind of compassion they may have with the conceptions they may have when we have this mood then actually we can speak effectively we can attract people to our krishna so that mood of compassion and followed by a careful selection of what we speak that's how we can attract people to krishna that's all i'll conclude with this that what is our purpose in speaking about krishna it is we should remove the walls the walls of misconceptions the walls of obstacles that they may have so krishna is here they are here whatever walls are there we want to remove those walls now sometimes the walls may be misconceptions and we may have to break those walls but if we speak in a judgmental condescending holier than thou way then what happens our words may become the walls because of which they may not come to krishna so if we keep that purpose in mind then we can always be effective in how we speak and yes if sometimes some misconceptions are actually stopping people from coming to krishna we need to we need to break those walls we need to challenge and correct those misconceptions but we don't have to presume that this is the misconception that is stopping people from coming to krishna yes somebody might be belonging to advaitic organization somebody might be worshiping a devta somebody might be eating meat but is that stopping them from coming to krishna right now if that is not let them come toward krishna and in due course the right time will come when we will address those issues so we focus on not just breaking walls but on breaking those walls that are stopping people from coming to krishna right now so everybody has so many misconceptions even we right now have misconceptions even i have misconceptions so now it's not that every single misconception has to be corrected right now which is the main misconception that is stopping people from coming toward krishna and for most people their conceptions are not what stop people from coming to krishna their misconceptions they may have practical problems you know I, this point is not clear to me this point can you explain this and if we if we are we logically explain things and if we are kind and cordial with them then that can attract them toward krishna that's how if we learn to be uh, sensitive in our speak you know we will attract many many people toward krishna some people may come all the way toward krishna but even those who don't come all the way toward krishna they will take a few steps toward krishna and they will appreciate krishna and krishna's devotees and that itself is spiritual advancement for them on the other hand if we don't do that if we become very judgmental in our speaking then what happens is we might attract very very few people but we will alienate a lot of people away from krishna because of our judgmental attitude and that we want to avoid very much so we want we can, we can imagine that the success in outreach is like a progressive thing 
that yes we attract some people will become very serious some people will become slightly serious some people will just become appreciative but everybody can be on their forward journey toward krishna and that would be the success of our speaking about krishna so i'll summarize what i spoke today i started by speaking about discipline of speaking based on the bhagavad gita 1715 so sensitive and sensible that's what is effective speaking and then two points i spoke within that first is how so how we may rationalize speaking wrong speaking strongly or even condemning people we may rationalize so i have to avoid that so what does for communication to be effective what do all do we need first is we look at what a person is a, what is my attitude toward my audience and then secondly how exactly i um, what exactly am i speaking so we want an attitude more of compassion not condescension and how do we develop that attitude of compassion not condescension it is by it is by helping people uh, by seeing seeing the good in people seeing what is right what is good in people to the extent we see that to that extent we can elevate we can be elevated and we can help them elevate and while seeing good in people what do we need to avoid we reduce avoid reducing people to their particular wrong behavior or even their wrong conceptions and that's why because people are not not categories they are conscious beings they are complex so we we'll discussed many examples how prabhupad while he spoke strongly sometimes but he was also expert the point was not speaking strongly or softly the point is uh, speaking in speaking effectively and uh, then the second part was we, truth may be unpalatable but that doesn't mean everything un, so called unpalatability is truth and it certainly doesn't mean that we have a right to speak unpalatably we learn we try to speak as sensitively as possible so that we can attract people toward krishna so thank you very much are there any reflections or questions hare krishna hey krishna hare krishna ram krishna. prabhu ji thank hare you so much in, in such a short time you explained uh, many many things actually <laughs> we have to go through our notes once again and uh, dive in to understand so thank you so much firstly for your time and uh, giving this very valuable tip because finally whatever study we will be doing uh, that is uh, behind the curtain uh, and when we are actually meeting the audience what is coming is our speech <laughs> so whatever uh, homework we have done does not matter finally uh, it matters that what is my inner consciousness which is also projecting the homework that is being done uh, so uh, can i ask one question and also yes, all of you devotees you can also ask so you spoke about prabhu ji that uh, attract and alienate these two things so sometimes uh, it can happen that the way we wish to deal with a particular person or a particular concept to be spoken and keeping in mind also that we have to be speaking the right words but somehow whatever is done uh, the person gets upset so uh, in that such a case uh, uh, what is to be done after that i mean there's little damage has happened because of the speech so because of the way we spoke or just the person has become offended for no reason or whatever whatever from our side we feel we have done the best only uh, taken all considerations and all things but still the person has got upset maybe is a new person also or can be even from the known uh, category like friends and family also it can be anyone but when such a thing happens then what we are supposed to do uh, okay so if you find that somebody is hurt or offended by something we have done or spoken what can we do yes it's not a pleasant situation to be in 
and especially if that relationship is important for us then it's even more unpleasant so basically two three things in general we can say that a person in we can you can look at fixing this kind of situation in three more in the three modes a person in rajoguna will think that you know i can't live without fixing this problem i have to fix this problem i have to make this person friendly toward me favorable toward me and basically in rajoguna we assume that we have more control than what we do mm-hmm. and we think it's entirely up to me to fix the problem mm-hmm. so we may talk with them we may talk with somebody connected with them and we may talk with somebody else and we may do so many things that that person feels even more pressured from so many directions sometimes some hurts need to be individually processed people need to themselves recover and then they can become more receptive to understand things from a broader or a different perspective so rajoguna means i think that i have to fix this right now immediately and we just take any and every means to try to fix it tamoguna is the other extreme where we think oh you know this always happens to me like this people get offended with me even when i have good intentions always people get hurt this is maybe something is intrinsically wrong with me i am worthless maybe i'll never be able to do anything like that so any i'll never be able to have good relationships i'll never be able actually able to help people come closer to krishna i'll never be able to do any service so here what happens is we underestimate the capacity to control that we have so in sattva guna sattvat sanjayate gyanam krishna says one of the results of sattva guna is knowledge that means when we are in the mode of goodness we can perceive properly okay what exactly did i do and how did this person see this what did i do to contribute to this problem and then to now our ego might say i didn't do anything or that would be rajoguna speaking our tamoguna may say that you no know, maybe i am only worthless i did something wrong i don't i don't even know what i did wrong but i keep doing wrong no try to objectively analyze as much as possible what was what did we do to cause this misconception if we didn't do much then we can say okay can i do something to fix this maybe i can uh, i can clarify what i meant when uh, what i meant or what i int- what was my purpose in doing whatever i did or spoke maybe if they're not ready to listen to me i can write to them maybe i can communicate to someone else but if that person is not at all ready to listen then we have to let go maybe time is the best healer i remember i was at a i was a in a mediation with i was tra- doing a mediation for a couple of devotees and one devotee approached and said that i it is the other devotee i know you are very angry with me and the other devotee said no i'm not angry with you he says anger is a very expensive emotion and you are not worth it <laughs> now if somebody has that arrogant or a dismissive attitude toward the other person it is going to be very difficult to have any kind of reconciliation so sometimes if people are just not ready to hear then what do we do we have to we have to let go maybe time will heal it happened with prabhupad also and sometimes some of his god brothers they objected to some of the things that prabhupad did now bhakti sanat thakur was known by the honorific prabhupad and when ishla prabhupad's disciples prabhupad suggested many bhakti dan swami when he was bhakti dan swami suggested many different names vishnu pad and other things prabhupad this can we call you prabhupad and prabhupad accepted so some of his disciples some of his god brothers felt that that our shila prabhupad was usurping the gaudiya mat shila prabhupad was usurping his own guru's position by taking the label prabhupad for himself but it's not not like that jiva swami was also called prabhupad so he tried to explain he, he said i had no intention uh, my spiritual master is my life and soul but some of them understood some of them didn't so what can we do now we shouldn't presume that there's nothing we can do that nothing we can do but if we find after objective analysis there's not much we can do then it's best to let go and move on okay any other questions or comments um, hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna um uh, prabhu ji uh, it could happen that uh, when we are trying to explain some concepts that uh, some people become may become aggressive uh, 
where they don't see our point of view especially there are two most important points is when we are trying to tell them that krishna is the supreme personality of godhead which is a very uh, you know a topic which many people don't um, agree with and um, about eating onion and garlic so these are the two main topics which i have seen when i have been trying to talk to people that uh, the bone of contention is these two main topics and uh, they become quite aggressive and say that uh, how do you say uh, i mean if we eat onion and garlic like are we any anything worse than what you are you know and they sort of argue like that so how how do we uh, control our uh, you know sort of emotions and at the same time try to make them uh, understand yes see mm. one of the if somebody is if somebody is becoming too aggressive on some contentious point such as krishna supremacy or say giving up onion garlic or eating it well one of the biggest skills that any effective teacher has to learn is to choose one's battles choose one's battles that means that is this some an issue that needs to be dealt with right now is this the most important thing that i even if the person has a particular conception and maybe it's wrong or they are saying that my conception is wrong is this what i need to deal with right now so if we notice that some issue is contentious and we we have certain answers we have given those answers and they don't find those answers convincing then we can always look for more scriptural references more logical points and we can come up with that but sometimes it is just that some battles are just best avoided avoided means that we decide yeah okay you know that's uh, we will come to that point later that's not the important thing right now so we are not saying that onion garlic is sinful onion garlic is not like eating meat it is tamasic so tamasic is the main in itself it has it has some negative influences on our consciousness but that's subtle so uh, are we saying that people who are eating that are bad no that's not the exact point we are saying we are saying that there are that we are trying to elevate our consciousness and according to our traditions wisdom there are certain things which aid in the elevation of consciousness and certain things which impede the elevation of consciousness or which actually accelerate the obfuscation or the contamination of consciousness so that is why we follow these now we can present it more in a descriptive way rather than a prescriptive way descriptive is this is how i understand it this is why we do it i'm not saying that you have to do it and if you don't do it you're wrong we don't have to emphasize that so rather than talking about the uh moral rightness or wrongness of the issue we can focus on the effect on the consciousness the effect on the consciousness is subtle the consciousness itself is very difficult to understand level of consciousness is difficult to understand the effect of uh, certain substances on le uh, the levels of consciousness is even more difficult to understand we might give some empirical some logical evidence but ultimately this is this is the traditions wisdom that we have and we are trying to raise our consciousness and the tradition has had many teachers who have specialized in in providing resources for raising the consciousness that's why we are following it so beyond that we don't have to make it a moral issue once we make it a moral issue and say somebody is wrong or bad for not taking it then we come on uh, on slippery territory it's not very easy to prove that so overall don't get into conflicting zones right now and even with respect to krishna supremacy there is a time and a place for talking about that and when is it necessary it depends there are very few indians or hindus or most of the audience that we interact with who will say that krishna is not god they'll say krishna is god but their problem comes when we say only krishna is god so now only krishna is god that is something which will take time for them to understand so we have to decide is this the battle that we want to fight right now 
sometimes it is sometimes it is not so that varies so if we find that okay if they are they are not accepting it they are finding it very difficult then we can say that okay you know there are a lot of other things in the philosophy let's discuss those and this is a contentious issue we can discuss this later so knowing which issues to address when is is vital for so for, vital for a effective speaker and um, in general so earlier i said look at what is it that is obstructing people from coming to krishna that wall we want to break we don't have to break every wall but another point is that not only that this is the wall to be broken well do i have the tools to break this wall right now if i don't have the tools then maybe let me not focus on that say if, if somebody considers ganesh is supreme and we say krishna is supreme and then we quote some scriptures and they go and do such search on google or they ask that some authority some some person they consider authority and they come up with some quotes and they say no this puran is not no, this is not the highest this is the highest and we get into too much of a debate with them and the end result is they think this this religion business is very confusing i can't even figure out who is god so better let me give up all this religion and become become a materialist become a atheist then we have done disservice to them so we have done serious disservice to them if uh, instead of elevating their faith we have confused them so much that they lose whatever faith they have also so that's why focus on speaking in a way that gradually elevates people the same mahabharat which has vishnu sahasra naam also has shiva sahasra naam so same lord chaitanya mahaprabhu was so devoted to krishna also went to the temple of bhuvaneshwar where lord shiva was there now it is described that many of the uh, people in bhuvaneshwar temple they in lord shiva's temple they became devotees on seeing lord chaitanya but it is there is no description that lord chaitanya in bhuvaneshwar temple preached to them that lord shiva is not god and you should worship krishna no he didn't do that he was just so filled with spiritual ecstasy that they became attracted to him so we have to choose our battles that would be my broad answer okay does it address the question yeah, uh, yes prabhu ji because actually this uh, these two points come up normally in when uh, somebody is attending a J josd journey of self discovery a six day mm -hmm. course so uh, one of the topics is one god or many gods so uh, this to this topic comes up about krishna supremacy and uh, the second about uh, onion and garlic is when we are telling uh, that we have when we offer uh, bhoga to the lord we offer without onion and garlic so we do, we are not telling them that you know that uh, since you are eating onion garlic is bad or something but we uh, tell them that uh, we have to offer uh, uh, food which doesn't contain onion and garlic to krishna so that also sometimes they say they ask uh, why not you know and things like that so it, that is the time when these two questions come up and that's why i was just asking i understand so we speak that point but it depends on in a, in a class we speak so many points which point we emphasize is the point that often people get discussions about so we can decide not to emphasize that point at that point mention it but no need to emphasize it make it a issue of debate okay any last okay prabhu ji thank, thank you, you. Hare Krishna Prabhu ji dhanyavad pranam can i ask a question yes ma'am hare krishna uh hare krishna so prabhu ji i have to this question regarding uh, about uh, can you hear yeah you mentioned about uh, when we are talking to people who are coming from advaita philosophy right <laughs> but in all the books it is said that asanga don't associate with uh, uh, mayavadis or those philosophies so how to understand this properly prabhu ji okay so it is said that we shouldn't associate with mayavadis uh, how do we understand this properly well first of all most of the people whom we consider mayavadis they themselves don't even know what is mayavad 
and a much more precise understanding would be that they are under mayavad influence they are not mayavadis in general any person who seeks a spiritual path they may read some books they may uh, they may hear some talks and they may get the idea oh the ultimate reality is like a light and i want to merge into that light and that seems very non sectarian and universal instead of worshiping this form or this deity or that deity so i wouldn't even call these person as impersonalists they are more non personalists they are not rejecting the personality of krishna they just don't know how krishna's personality is transcendental so mayavad is a very very specific philosophy and even if somebody is even officially affiliated with a, a mayavadi organization even if they are formally initiated by a mayavadi teacher even then most people when they join a philosophical organization or they join a spiritual organization it is not for they it is not because of the philosophy there are so many reasons they may join it for the culture okay they are teaching some good thing to the children and that's why i, I took my children over there or you know i had to do some puja and the uh, priest from that organization came and did the puja and he was a nice person that's how we developed a relationship with that person or their temple was closest to our house and that's how i started going there so philosophy is rarely the sole determinant or even the primary determinant for most people connecting with some spiritual organization spiritual group so yes we shouldn't associate with mayavadis what it means is that people who are actively denigrating the personality of krishna and who are mm, who are likely to undermine our faith and our devotion to krishna those are the people we shouldn't associate with but the most of the people whom we call mayavadis how often do they do that for them as i said they are under mayavad influence and they might be because of culture because of so many other things they might be under that influence so we have to be very careful about for whom we apply the word, word mayavadi so association also what does it association mean prabhupada was associating with the, dr mishra so was he disobeying lord chaitanya's instruction we may say that he is a exalted devotee yes that may be true but prabhupada also set example for others so uh even when his very young disciples would be their female disciples he would not uh, spend time alone with them he would always have somebody else in his room with them whenever they would come so prabhupada very was strict he was strict but he he didn't uh, he didn't avoid spending time with uh, dr mishra so the point is what is association the essence of association is not physical proximity it is the transfer of desires and and conceptions primarily transfer of desires when do we associate with someone we associate with someone when their desires become our desires so otherwise we are not really associating now devotees in the west may go to a uh one of the biggest places where devotees distribute books is say in america it's football games or uh, rugby games or baseball games it's it's complete mania over there recently there was a the soccer world cup in uk and devotees usually at that time they do huge book distribution now they are going over there are they associating with all those soccer fans or those, which are sports fans well they are not going there they are not getting those desire they are going there to distribute books so uh, if if their desire for uh, worshiping something beyond krishna is not coming to us then that is not association with mayavadis so two things first of all don't uh, jump don't very loosely apply the label mayavadi to people just because they are affiliated with something which is mayavadi and secondly don't equate physical proximity or say some discussion or even some courtesies with association so when we talk about say uh, when we are dealing with mayavadi say somebody has come to our program or maybe we are socially or relationally connected with someone who has that kind of conceptions then we can courteously deal with them as is appropriate okay so thank you very much for your thoughtful questions you. and wish wish you all the very best in your uh, 
future services wherever you get the opportunity to speak and uh, and thanks to kalyan radhika mata ji for giving me this opportunity and for yourself taking prabhu ji you got muted okay so what was the last thing you heard thanking mata ji okay <laughs> so i uh, thank you mata for giving this opportunity and uh, thank you for taking up this initiative to teach i met mata ji several times after my programs and we talked i will notice how thoughtful and appreciative she was about well presented philosophy but only recently i came to know how much preaching she is doing how many programs she is having and how many uh, ways in which she is sharing krishna bhakti so she told me i told her that you know me probably you are doing more preaching than many brahmacharis also so in one sense she is embodying Uh, sharing krishna bhakti and it's good that you got the opportunity to uh, learn and I pray that prabhu pad and krishna empower all of you to share krishna bhakti more and more far and wide thank you very much isla prabhu pad ki jai thank you very much for krishna bhakti ki jai jai gaur premanand hari bol hari hari bol is grace chaitanya charan prabhu ki jai थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू